Welcome to Dig Deep, the mining podcast. In this podcast, we go deep into mining news, hot topics, and live interviews with mining professionals and leading figures in the mining industry. Introducing your host, Rob Tyson, founder and director of Mining International and Mining International Executive, a leading global mining recruitment and headhunting agency. Hi, mining community. Welcome back to another episode of the Dig Deep, the mining podcast. And today's guest is Errol Smart, who's the MD and CEO of Orion Minerals, who are a globally diversified metals explorer and developer uh, who are on track to become a new generation based metals producer through their development of their flagship Pescara Copper Zinc project. And it's near to um, Oc. OKEP Copper Project, both located in South Africa's Northern Cape. Um, Errol's a geologist with a significant industry experience across all aspects of exploration, mineral, uh, sorry, mine development and operations with experience in precious and base metals. And has been on a number of boards of listed companies, both on the TSX and the ASX. Um, Errol is gonna share with us the story of Orion Minerals. Um, what they have achieved and what the outlook of the company is. So that's welcome, Errol, to the podcast. How are you doing, Errol? Hi, Rob. Very good. Thank you. And good, good to meet you. Um, obviously, I've, I've met you a few times, a few times at a few conferences, um, and it's it's uh, obviously great to have you on the podcast. So I wondered if you can, um, as we always start these podcasts off, I wondered if you can give us a little bit about. The background of you of yourself and your career um uh, before we go into uh talking about Orion uh, minerals yeah sure look I, as you said i'm a geologist by background somewhere in ancient history i started my career with anglo gold actually on the deep waters rain gold mines um unfortunately i'm a bit of a anti-corporate minded person and as a young man I was a little bit of a handful on the mines and eventually the, my boss said to me enough of that and sending you off to the bush because you'd be better off doing geology in the bush which was the biggest favor he could ever have done for me so I got involved in exploration but uh, quite early I was fortunate enough to get involved in a British company Clough, uh, Clough Mining at the time, and LG Clough, who is one of the big famous personalities in junior mining, very well known in London. And that really, I found my home as soon as I got into junior mining. Um, that very flat, very energetic, very entrepreneurial environment is exactly what suited me. Um, and very quickly as a junior miner or in the junior mining world, you're no longer a specialist. So started off as a geologist but i very quickly had to learn all the skills and got involved in actual mining and um to see in, in the gold mining world open pits and underground and whatever you and got to travel the world and see a lot of deposits which was very fortunate it's a fantastic opportunity in in the in person's career to be able to really get around and and see all sorts of things so yeah um 10 years ago 2012 i got involved with orion at the time it was called uh, uh, orion gold and had some gold exploration projects in victoria and queensland and then it was just before the big discovery of Nova Bollinger in Fraser Range um, in Western Australia. We got involved in that. And I quite quickly realized that the geology that we were looking at in Western Australia was very similar to an area that I had seen in the Northern Cape of South Africa. And I actually convinced the company, the shareholders, to come over to South Africa and pick up what is a completely overlooked, fantastic opportunity with identical geology to the Fraser Range and to a number of very high productivity areas in Australia. Great. I wonder if you can give us an overview of uh, Orion Minerals as a company and obviously uh, the history of the history of the company. 
Yeah, so when I got involved in Orion, it really was a, 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 a gold explorer and a wannabe developer in Australia. Um, we got involved more in base metals in the Fraser range. And at the time when it became clear, and at the time words like critical metals and future-facing metals weren't even cloned yet. You know, people weren't using those words. And ESG wasn't a term. We spoke about doing things the right way and going into the right commodities for the future. Um, but we realized that the, the big boom was likely to be in the copper, the nickel, the zinc, um, and the minerals that have now become known as the critical metal suite. And we did an exercise in Iran and looked at projects around the world because our shareholders and investors wanted us to find something that we could bring into production but by the mid-2020s. And we looked at a number of projects in South America, North America, Asia, even in Australia. And we, we were a micro cap at the time. You know, we had a market cap of about four or five million dollars. And we couldn't find something that we could really make an impact that was really going to work for us. And the more I looked at these projects around the world, there was something that stood out is I kept seeing geology that I had seen previously in South Africa and at the time wasn't being touched or progressed by anybody. Um, and in South Africa, we had an infrastructural advantage possibly. Now, South Africa isn't an easy operating environment. We all know that. But the more I looked at it, the more I saw that the risk reward was skewed and there was a much bigger reward to be had in South Africa than what there was elsewhere in the world where these opportunities presented themselves. And, you know, I'm, you could start asking yourself the question is, yes, it's challenging in South Africa, but, and, and let's just take the current challenges that people speak about. You know, everybody immediately when you mention South Africa says, oh, but what about the grid power? The grid power is unreliable. Yes, the grid power is now unreliable, but we've got grid power and there is grid power 60 to 80 percent of the time. Whereas I know that if I go to the middle of the outback in Australia or the middle of the Atacama Desert or West Africa, there is no grid power. There is no rail facility. There are no working ports. All of those things are things that we have in South Africa. They're less functional than what they used to be, but they do still work. And you can still manage your environment and you can actually still do very well. And South Africa is the, the center of, of African mining. Your skill set, your supply chain all works through South Africa. Put that on top of exceptional geology and there's just an incredible opportunity in South Africa. So I convinced the, the key shareholders at the time that we should actually focus our efforts on South Africa, where we could get much more bang for the buck. And that's what it came down for. The, the price of acquiring a very significant asset in South Africa was a fraction of the price of doing anywhere else in the world. And over the last seven years now, seven years since we started in South Africa, we've acquired over 9,000 square kilometers of prospecting and mining rights. We've got four fully executed mining rights. The mo historic mines on our properties have produced more than two and a half million tons of copper equivalent base metals. These were very successful, very significant scale base metals in the 1970s and 80s. And because of what happened politically in South Africa, and South Africa has gone through monumental change in the 90s and the early 2000s and is ongoing, these projects eventually closed. They were undercapitalized. They couldn't continue producing. They closed, but they closed not because all bodies were exhausted, but only because they were undercapitalized because of investment appetite. And that's what really created the opportunity for us. So we were able to come in, first mover advantage. We've secured the absolute cream of the crop, the best projects in, in the Northern Cape. We now have three very advanced stage projects. Two of them were very significant large-scale mines in the past. 
producing copper as a primary mineral, but uh, copper, zinc uh, with gold and silver byproducts, a little bit of lead. Um, and the other project that we have is a very advanced stage, nickel, copper, cobalt, platinum, um, chloron, sulfide deposit that uh, really is very re reminiscent of what one sees in the Fraser Range. I just wondered if you can just tell us a little bit more about those uh, two projects individually. Yeah, so the Prisca mine, which is really our flagship operation, um, it, it was found by old timers uh, in 19, uh, 1890 odd, but it was really abandoned and not much was done on it because it's very remote. It's in a very deserted area. But uh, in 1968, the Anglo Vol Group, which was one of the big South African mining houses at the time, came back to the project and started drilling and actually found this amazing VMS, and it's a true exhalative VMS deposit. It's um, it's probably the, the closest um, analogy to the Kids Creek deposit anywhere in the world. It's a true exhalative. So it's deposited on the quiescent ocean floor, um, very old, 1.2 uh, billion odd years old. It's thick. It's 2.4 kilometers of strike. Um, it's been mined down dip for more than a thousand meters. Um, it's produced 46 million tons of massive sulfide ore over an average width of nine meters. And the strike extensions and the dip extension of this ore body, and at the bottom where, of where the mine is now, the ore body changed dr dip dramatically. And at the time, Anglovol would have needed to recapitalize the mine to mine a flat dipping ore body. But we have now drilled up more than 31 million tons of resource on this deposit. Um, it's superb metallurgy. It's serviced by power and roads and water pipelines from the Orange River, all that were put in originally by the Anglo Vol Group. So it's a brownfield site with all the key capital investment made for us. There's 37 kilometers of underground roadways, which we're going to be using in the mine development. There's a fantastic concrete lined, eight meter diameter concrete line shaft down to 1,100 meters depth. And we are going to be refurbishing this mine and restarting up this mine, commencing this month, we're starting to drill and blast and bring it in, into production with the with a objective of five years from now, we'll be doing about 22,000 tons a year of copper and 60,000 tons a year of zinc in concentrates, which we will ship out through the existing ports in South Africa. And, and uh, that project is very well advanced. We've secured a very innovative funding package for it because South Africa is very difficult. You can't just do standard bank project financing. Um, I thought we were going to be able to pull it off and we tried very hard. But the reality in South Africa is single asset exp exploration companies trying to develop mines. You just don't get the bank financing lined up. And the equity finance also becomes very expensive. So we looked at an alternative financing mechanism and uh, eventually arrived at a combination of um, bringing in a parastatal development finance agency. In South Africa, we've got the Industrial Development Corporation, which is really the premier financing source for mine development in South Africa. So they've come in as, as partners in this project. They've put in a convertible loan at the moment for 250 million. It's convertible into the actual project company's shares, and they will end up holding about 19% of the project company. Alongside that, we then brought in a streaming and royalty finance package. The streaming is 80 million euros, and it is only in regard to the gold and silver credits for a period of time. So it's very low impact on our revenue stream. It's not at all involved in our um, primary minerals. And it's a 
it's you know streaming is very interesting because it's patient finance if you're not producing it you're not paying anything so they sit there and they bet on you they take an essentially an equity type bet on the management team to produce the minerals to be delivered to them to really accelerate the process, they then also gave us 10 million Aussie dollars on top of it to kickstart the early development and of the mine. So that $10 million is against 0.8% of our revenue stream for the for the life of mine. Um, it is relatively high risk capital, but it's intended to actually break the back of of the uncertainty, if you like. So we're going in and we're actually doing trial mining. We'll be stockpiling all, we're putting in pumps and uh, dewatering gear to get the mine dewatered. The, the mine, which was a very dry mine, but in this desert area, when you do get uh, rain, there are flash floods. The farmer in this area during the 30 years that the mine was closed was diverting the water into the mine to try flood the mine and turn it into a giant well. Unfortunately, after 30 years, he's only been able to fill about two thirds of the mine. Um, so we do have to dewater the mine and it takes time and it takes money. Um, and between the IDC and triple flag uh, royalty funding, we are able to get that underway at the moment. And I'm at the mine site at the moment. We're busy installing pumps and pumping systems and the Mining contractors are busy mobilizing to sites, so there's a whole lot of exciting activity happening at the moment. So that's our, our flagship. Um, the second project, that, which is just as exciting as far as I'm concerned, is the Okip district, where we've tied up about 75% of a historic production area originally um, developed by Newmont, and then taken over by Goldfields, and it operated until 2001. It had its own smelter. And they used to smelt between 40 and 60,000 uh, 60, tons a year of copper in the smelter there. Um, back in the early 2000s, when metal prices was down and the smelter is very remote and fueling the smelter became very expensive, they decided to turn off the smelter and they actually shut the mine down and stripped the mine. But... The mine records at the time showed uh, over 100 million tons of ore remaining, of which we now have 70 million tons in our stable. We've drilled the first 12 million tons and taken that to Jork Resource. We're busy doing the balance of it at the moment. And we've just finished our first feasibility study to bankable standards. And that has been handed over to independent and technical experts for sign off. And we expect that project to be signed off and ready for an FID early 2024. And between that and Priska, that's really our big kickstart of, of the, the company. Um, probably the real cherry on the cake for us is we've secured absolutely the right cornerstone investors to take us into this early development stage. The, the Clover Group um, is really the, the Kotzer family and the Fleming family. The Flemings are obviously very well known in, in London, Adam Fleming um, and the Fleming partners. They are behind the Clover Group in South Africa where they're mining chrome and platinum mineralization on the bushveld. They saw what we were doing, and over a period of year, a year, we were speaking to them. And early this year, we finally shook hands of the deal, finally did the deal, and they have put in very significant capital investment. And they are the ideal equity partners for us to take this project forward. They understand mining in South Africa. They understand small-scale mining in South Africa. They understand the operating environment. They have their own capital. They make their own decisions. It's very short, uh, short timelines to get to decisions. They're working closely with myself and my management team, and that really brings us access to another, you know, thirty-six million dollars Australian dollars of funding. 
that we're busy deploying over the next year. So fantastic, exciting period for Orion. You know, being in a, an explorer was a tough gig in South Africa. Being a study company was an even tougher gig. It's very difficult to get investor excitement up when you're doing feasibility studies. But now we're going into development and we're going into development with a pot of money in the bank that I've never had for the 10 years that we've been at Orion. But, you know, we've got over 200 million rand in the bank today and I've got contractors arriving on site and ready to break ground. So it's an incredibly exciting time for Orion to, to be getting this done. And it's at the right time for the mineral suite. These critical minerals, long-term cycle is very, very much intact. And yes, right now the copper price might be a little bit down and the zinc price might be a little down. The long-term growth profile driven by the transition in, in energy is very much focused on the need for copper. And while the metal prices are down, it actually slows down capital development on copper mines, which is even going to stimulate the, the metal price more going forward. So perfect time for us to be building. Our cost structure is South African RAND based. We'll be bringing mines into production next year that are producing an export commodity and earning hard currency. So that's a perfect value cycle for us. Yeah, and that's obviously an interesting financial structure that you have. Um, you're also dual listed on the ASX and the JSC. How does that work? Yeah, when we came to South Africa, you know, we, we said we needed to do things differently. And part of doing this differently is we wanted to give South Africans an opportunity to become equity investors and actually become part of what we're doing. It was a grand plan at the time. We didn't do an IPO. We didn't raise money on the listing in Johannesburg. We had been listed in Australia for a long period. So we did a secondary listing, which worked very well for us. And slowly but surely, Australians started bringing stock over and selling it into the Johannesburg. It's, it's the same share is tradable on both sides of the water. That's fully fungible. There's anybody can buy a share in Sydney and sell it in Johannesburg and vice versa. So it works very well. Um, there is the market skepticism about South Africa, which plays a very interesting role in our share price. And on an average day, our Johannesburg share price in Australian dollars, expressed in the Australian dollars at the exchange rate of the day, trades at a, a significant premium to the Australian price. Now, as soon as the volumes get high enough, there's arbitrage traders that climb in and start trading very big volumes for a period of time. And then that finally wipes out the arbitrage for a period. Generally, the Australian price gets lifted up closer to the Johannesburg price and the arbitrage gets closed. The arbitrage traders are out of the market and then there'll just be the normal turnover. But as that has happened over the years, more and more stock has come over from Australia to South Africa. And we, we currently have 37% of our shares are actually on sitting on the Johannesburg register. Um, the balance sit on the Australian register. And quite interestingly, our Australian register is predominantly Europeans. So Europeans are our biggest shareholders. And that's institutional investment. All of our, our European investors, a very small amount are retail. The greater majority are institutional investors, a lot of it out of Germany, some of it out of the Netherlands. Um, Tembo Capital, Oslo, our biggest shareholder. And that's a Netherlands um, private equity fund managed out of London and out of Brisbane. But uh, that is all European money that comes via the ASX. So it does work very well. We're very proud of the fact that we've got over six and a half thousand South African individuals on our register. And of that six and a half thousand South African individuals, when we do an analysis of the names, uh, about 80% of them are the historically disadvantaged South Africans, so indigenous South Africans. Now, I see this as a great empowerment story. You know, South Africa talks a lot about um, black empowerment. 
But this is the true story of black empowerment because people are able to buy and sell our shares freely on any day. And people invest to make a, a return on investment on their equity and they're doing it very comfortably. So it's been a great success story. When I walked down the streets of Prisca on Saturday morning, when I came into little Prisca town, which is a village of 16,000 people, I was walking around the road and people come up to me and they greet me. Hey, Errol, how's things going? I bought some more shares last week. It's looking wonderful. Do you know how that feels when your community? I can imagine it feels. I can imagine it feels really excited that you've obviously got local people that are coming up to you because you're making a difference to their lives. Yeah, well, and they're part of it. You know, they are part of yeah. this mine. It's, it's part of their future, and and stakeholder engagement. You can talk about it as much as you like, and all this ESG stuff. But it does work if you've got your community aligned with you and their interests aligned with what you're doing. It makes life a lot easier. Yeah, you just obviously mentioned ESG there. Um, what ESG initiatives has has the company been involved in so far, and what sort of ESG initiatives are you looking to, to I suppose, to um, to bring in as the project develops or these projects develop? So part of our business strategy when we came in is from day one, when we started exploring, is we really try to push the the ESG angle. And as I say, when we started, it was just called Dewey Development Projects that we've been pushing along over the years, working with uh, um, some um, the volunteer services we've done the collection of 400 bicycles in australia that we handed out to the community over here so that kids could get from the rural areas to school um, we support a, a fantastic initiative of a lady that looks after disabled children she created her own disabled children's uh, remedial center um, just funded out of donations we actually took her over to Australia ourselves and Qantas took her over to Australia a couple of months ago and did a gala dinner and raised some money for her there. Um, a lot of that is the small things, but they count. Our bigger programs are about things like water provision. We are busy upgrading the town of Prisca's water provision. Um, part of it for our own use, obviously, we'll be pumping water to the mine from the town of Prisca, but the town will benefit from that. We're looking at skills training and uh, enterprise development. So we're trying to get our host communities involved in becoming part of the supply chain for the mine. Um, we just about to send a whole heap of people off for training as machine operators and fitters and turners. So we are very focused on local employment. You are obligated to do that by law now in South Africa as well, but we go above and beyond that. Um, but very much driven by local enterprise development, local skills training, skills transfer, trying to get the community see, to see the long-term opportunity. What's life after the mine for the community? Getting them to establish businesses that will survive beyond the life of mine. Now, we might be, uh, and we'd like to believe here, we're going to be here for 20, 25 years. But every mine has got a finite life. Eventually, these mines will close. And the, the communities mustn't be left stranded by the mine closing. They must use the mine as seed capital to get them going and go into a longer term development. We, we're busy with an incredibly exciting test work program at the moment on our water treatment of the water that we're going to pump out the mine we're going to be pumping 500 cubic meters thousand liters an hour for three years now what do we do with that water it's in the middle of the desert um one of the things that we're testing at the moment and it's really looking very positive is actually to extract the salts out of that water and turn it into agricultural fertilizers and the test work is looking amazing at the moment, so I don't want to say too much about it. Um, as soon as the test work is complete, we'll make some announcements about it. But it looks like we could be a very significant uh, fertilizer producer in South Africa. 
this this area of Presque is Orange River. It's the biggest river in South Africa. And the, the Orange River is a big irrigation farming center. So the farmers here need good quality fertilizers. And uh, we'll also be producing high quality, um, potable quality water. So there's potential to get an irrigation farming arrangement going. Um, so there's all sorts of exciting ESG things that can be done. And that ESG, you know, a, a lot of people see ESG as something painful than, and an obligation. We see it as an opportunity. The stuff that we're doing with our community, uh, it really does warm your heart, but it doesn't detract from value. It adds value because we'd rather be dealing with local people that we don't have to have FIFO. We don't have any foreign workers. We only have South African nationals. We're trying to be 70% local staffed, um, local being in the province where we where we are situated. Um, all of that has got a, a commercial outcome. And nowadays, it also brings access to finance. Triple flag, um, their, their funding obligations are very strict on ESG. And we had a lot of ESG compliance auditing and the, the ESG plans that we had already put together for the mine were one of the deciding factors in us actually getting the triple flag financing lined up. So it does bring opportunity, and I'm pleased that we do it. It's the right way. And if you're operating in a country like South Africa that has to change its ways, it's a it's a historic mining country that can be mining for a long time, but it needs to change the way it does it, and that's what we're doing. Yeah, no, and, and that's good to hear. Um, you you're involved in a lot of active uh, projects and i know you've got a, a third project that you're working on at the moment which you you're uh, more than welcome to explain um what is the current focus uh, on these projects um is there a particular focus you're focusing on one particular project rather than other the other projects yeah only because of the stage of permitting um the prisca mine will be the first cab off the rank um, it's a fully permitted project. So we, as I said, we're busy. Uh, we've secured a very significant chunk of financing for this, and we are getting underway at the moment. The last decision that remains to be made is on the actual sign-off on the processing plant and the concentrator plant. We expect to be at that position by year end and be in production towards the middle of next year. Um, the next one will be the OKIP project, which we've just finished the bankable study. We've also just submitted the final water use licenses and water extraction uh, applications and tailings management uh, designs. So that's about six months away from being fully permitted. And then we'll kick that project off as well on a small scale development. All of these projects, we are facilitating they grow us now by starting small with the intention of growing big. So that's our new mantra. Instead of going for the massive mine outright, we will build a small plant and get small production going early, generate a little bit of cash flow while we do the rest of the development. You know, Prisca originally was going to take us uh, four years before we produced any cash flow and five and a half years before we reach peak production we'll still reach peak production in five and a half years, but now we're likely to have cash flow within 12 months. That changes the profile of the company completely. It will be small, it will be modest to start with, but it will grow and grow incrementally over the five years until we hit the peak production level. What are some of the key challenges that the company are are facing. I noticed on the, your presentation, there's long lead project times um, and also, also uh, dewatering challenges. Um, I just want to be next explain a little bit about that and maybe some of the other challenges the company is facing. Yeah, look, those are the challenges we were facing largely was the long lead time with the dewatering on the Prisca mine. Um, it is a big volume of water. It's an expensive exercise to pump it out and handle it. In terms of the South African Water Act, we have to treat everything to aquatic standard, not even drinking water standard. It's got to be better than drinking water standards before we can discharge it. 
we're fortunate that the mine isn't acidic. Um, you know, most mines, you're looking at acid mine water. This mine, the water's pH neutral, but it has got a large load. There's a large calcium, magnesium, sodium content in the water. Track that before we can discharge the water. Um, it's it's quite amazing though. It's an exponential cost curve, capital and operating cost when you're treating water and pumping water. So if you pump at a third of the volume, your costs come down to 15 or 20 percent of the capital and OPEX. So there's a there's a disproportionate saving by going smaller. So what we did is say, well, let's go smaller. Originally, we were going to pump at 1,500 cubic meters an hour. We will now only pump at 500 cubic meters an hour. So it will take us longer, but we can start quicker. We can get it going quicker. So the lead time is brought down. And uh, while we're doing that, we're going to actually start the small scale production from the area that's already above the water. Our water level is currently at about 270 meters. So we've we've got in Jork resources now over 4 million tons of ore sitting above the water level. So we're going to get started with mining that and, and moving it forward. So those challenges, we very quickly moving out the way. And now we're getting to the normal mine startup challenges, you know, mobilizing contractors, signing contracts, um, getting people on sites, getting the electricity connected, getting the fans running, getting the pumps installed. So it's an exciting time for us. It's a transition away from being a study company and an exploration company to actually being a genuine development company. You're involved in a number of metals, obviously, across your projects. Is there certain metals that you're actually focusing on? And is there a particular reason why? Look, we, we like copper the most because no matter what you use in the energy cycle, you have to use copper predominantly. So we believe that copper has got the, the greatest stability in the value chain. So copper is our primary focus, but we do like the fact that almost all of these base metal mines, you've got significant byproduct metals. Um, and that sort of smooths your risk profile a little bit. So Prisca is a copper zinc mine. At the moment, the revenue stream would be about 60% copper, 40% zinc. But over the five years, six years that we've been studying this mine, it's fluctuated from times when the zinc actually was a predominant revenue stream and copper was a secondary revenue stream. And that shows you that having a very significant byproduct can cushion you against some of the, the dirtier tricks that the market can play on you. Um, but we do, our, our, our love and our focus and the metals that we really bet on are copper, nickel, zinc. Um, we will be producing cobalt and platinum as significant byproducts, as well as gold and silver. The gold and silver is largely financed Prisca now, so it's a very important byproduct. That's only about 4% of our revenue stream, but 4% of such a large revenue stream gives you a very interesting leverage to be able to finance off. So we like being polymetallic, if you like, but our focus is very much on copper. And lastly, what is your short and medium term sort of outlook of the company? And I suppose looking at the medium, medium term, what do you expect to be producing? Yeah, look, it's an interesting challenge being on the ASX and what you allow to say on the ASX. So at the moment, we, we stick very much to what we put out in scoping studies and feasibility studies. So five years from today, um, we expect to be producing about 30,000 tons a year of copper and about 70,000 tons a year of zinc. So that's equivalent of about 60,000 tons a year of copper equivalent. What we're going to do from next year for four years as we grow up and that growth cycle, we will be able to put out in the market early next year when we've updated our feasibility studies and we can actually express it in the market. But I can just tell you that uh, it's very opportunistic 
there's high grade ore immediately available on face that we can drill and blast at both of our mines. And we are finding very innovative ways to put in concentrated plants and everything else to get done that uh, will give us a, a nice growth platform over the next four years till we reach our peak production. And I suppose lastly, or concluding, um, is there anything else that you would like to uh, tell our audience? Um, our audience are predominantly, I would say, uh, people from the mining industry, although we do have investors listening also. So I just wonder if you had any uh, final and concluding words. Yeah, look, I think South Africa is an environment where junior miners have been um, ignored largely. What we're trying to do is something very innovative for South Africa. We are trying to bring very modern mining methods. Um, it's methods commonly in use in Australia, but not commonly in use in South Africa. It's fully mechanized, drift and fill or long hole open stoping with paste filling. Um, that is not the common way of mining in South Africa. South Africa still has a very labor intensive system. Um, most mining is via shafts. We will be mining via decline systems with our mechanized equipment. Um, all of these ore bodies are well proven, well known from a metallurgical perspective, but they were lost treated. You know, the last metallurgical plant was built in 1971. Um, the opportunity of using newer machines, um, better processing technology, just to get better recoveries, produce better quality concentrates. Those are all fantastic opportunities. And, you know, I haven't even spoken about it and I won't take your time up at the moment, but we love getting involved in some of the research and development stuff that's happening and, and focused out of South Africa. So we're involved in some very interesting metal vapor refining technology for our nickel, copper, cobalt, platinum mineralization. Um, the future of mining is going to change. So the, the minerals that are in demand is changing. There's a greater focus on the some of the more obscure minerals and things that most people didn't even think of five years ago. You know, the, the lithiums and the rare earth elements are now commonly being produced as byproducts. We have a number of those. We will be looking at those. Um, so there's just an absolute amazing opportunity in South Africa that's ignored because people have, have decided that South Africa is too difficult for them. It's nowhere as difficult as what people think. And I'm very happy that we moved here, moved back here for myself. I was out of South Africa. I came back because I saw the opportunity. I'm personally heavily invested in Orion and in the future of these metals and in the Northern Cape of South Africa. And I think it's a fantastic opp opportunity and the growth, yeah, using modern technology is fantastic. I will really appreciate your time and thank you for obviously sharing your uh, journey. It seems that you've been obviously very active over the last obviously 10 years uh, since uh, you obviously uh, joined the company. Um, and there's obviously, there's a, there's a lot ahead that you've got ahead and obviously wish you all uh, best in the future and, and hopefully you can come onto the podcast next year and give us an update on on some of your projects and some of your other initiatives that you've uh, just mentioned thank you very much i certainly will yeah um and also just lastly what um social media platforms are you on so our audience can uh, follow follow your story orion has got a twitter um Twitter and Facebook. Um, I'm on LinkedIn and people can follow us there. Yes, and we, we can include those in the show notes accompanying this uh, podcast for easy access. So uh, thank you, Errol. All the best for the remainder of the year and next year. Um, and for those that are listening, I um, hope you enjoyed that episode. Uh, certainly a lot to take away. Um, we don't have many guests that are mining in South Africa. Uh, so um, it was certainly a, um, a, a lot of information that we can take away from there. So um, appreciate your time. 
please keep sharing these episodes uh, amongst people within the industry, but also people outside of the industry so we can improve um, the brand of mining and people that are not in the mining industry actually understand what we do. So appreciate your continued support. And until next time, happy mining. Thank you for listening. Remember to reach out to Rob via the show notes and be sure to subscribe and leave a review. Until next time, happy mining, helping each other to improve the mining industry.